All right, Krishna, everyone. This is Achyuta Baba from Nightlight Astrology, and I'm doing another Q&A episode today. Um, another great question that I received, so hopefully you will find this episode interesting. Uh, now, there's two parts of this question. The first one goes like this. I heard you mention that in our thousands, if not millions upon millions of lifetimes, um, uh, you mentioned your mention of millions boggled my mind. Thousands and is hard enough to fathom, especially with one life can be hard enough at times. But being other creatures, animals, bugs, otherworldly beings, you found this to be true in your ayahuasca experiences? Question mark. I believe I've read about this in what the Hindu religion and similar believe. If we keep on having many incarnations, do we or is there potential or possibility to come back another Life as an animal or bug, again, what about trees, plants, rocks, animals? I know it sounds funny to ask this question. So yeah, the Vedic scriptures are very clear that we transmigrate from, you know, they list like 88,400,000 different species of, of life. Who knows what the exact number is? But the idea is that the soul is here to experience what it means to be a part and not in just one form, what, what it means to be an independent, you know, having the kind of temporary illusory experience of being totally independent little creator God in tons of different forms, animal forms, tree forms, rock forms, you know, any kind of form that's alive, right? So uh, yeah, so yeah, we go through many different forms of life and in ayahuasca ceremonies, since you asked the question, um, yeah, I had the experience of going, cycling through, I mean, uh, it's hard to explain, but yeah, I mean, I had, had the experience of um, remembering what it felt like physically at times to be different types of animals. Uh, and these are experiences that many people have. It's not just me with ayahuasca in particular. But it made me realize right away that the human form of life is very, very precious. And this is the bottom line. It doesn't really matter. There's so many different forms of life. But, you know, apparently the human life is one of those forms that is very unique and rare in terms of its ability to be self-reflective and not more dominated by the modes of nature, meaning, you know, hunting, mating, sleeping, defending, eating, stuff like that. Um, there's not that there isn't pleasure and there isn't some reflection of love and playfulness in all species, you know, and, and some of the most beautiful qualities are, are on display in nature. The intelligence of God is on display in nature. So it's not to say, oh, it's all worthless, but the human form is so unique because we have the ability to use our mouth to speak uh, spiritual sound vibrations as through mantra. Um, and we have the ability to inquire into our nature and into the nature of reality and into, into the nature of God. And our, so whether it's Buddhism or yoga, you'll see this across the line. The human form of life is considered very precious and we're not to squander it at all, um, doing things that animals tend to do. And they're not penalized for it. It actually, there's very many, pla many places in scripture that says animals aren't accruing karma in the same way that other forms of life are because they're because they are more dominated by the laws of nature. It's not like they're sitting out there with as much agency with which to then uh, create a ton of different uh, karma with. Um, so it's not like that they're penalized for being an animal, but we're not to be animal like because we have the capacity to be more elevated than to be purely run more purely run by our instincts, hunting, mating, sleeping, defending, you know, a, a, a dominance, things like that, which if you don't think that they're there, you know, just turn on National Geographic for 10 minutes, even though I, I love National Geographic and I love nature, but it's a, it's a tooth and nail place out there and everything's eating and hunting and yes, you know, it's, it's full on. Uh, survival is a really intense part of it. So this life affords us not luxury and, and escape from nature. We're still a part of nature. In fact, in our attempt to escape nature, in some ways, we we reveal the worst side of ourselves, of our own human nature, by trying to pretend as though nature doesn't exist and live in an ivory tower apart from it. But nonetheless, um, you know, there's a a difference in what we can do with our consciousness. That that is, it, it's very rare. The Dalai Lama even said, you know, 
from a different tradition than, than yoga, but similar. The Dalai Lama said that, you know, coming up into this in a human form, being born into human form is like coming up in the great ocean of material existence in coming right up into a, a life preserver. So it's very, very thought of as very precious opportunity. And yeah, we can go up and down the evolutionary ladder of different types of experiences. Uh, uh, not that a ladder is maybe not even the right word, just the, the web of life. We can go all around it. And what guarantees that we will continue moving toward our spiritual form and inhabiting and waking up in our spiritual form, so to speak, is when we use the opportunities that we get while circling through these different forms of life to evolve that we've taken them. And that gives us more opportunities to keep growing and to keep peeling off the layers and emerging in our, you know, in our, in our spiritual birthday suit. <laughs> so anyway, that's the idea. Now you said in your next question, next question is one that I don't know how to delicately put it or just be blunt. And it's not just a random question. I find myself thinking this all the time and all of my life, really, since a child, I will sound judgmental and I don't mean to, but here it goes. So you walk into Walmart and you see many people, but there are some that seem to not have any care or respect for their body or cleanliness. They come in looking like they rolled out of bed, still in their pajamas, some even in slippers. I know I'm sounding harsh. And there are some that are perfectly content with living in a home they don't bother to clean. And life may exist around television, cigarettes, food that's bad for your health, alcohol or drugs, or any or all of those. Do you know what I mean? Their life seems to have no real purpose, but existing or getting by or a purely self-centered life. And you can find self-centered egotistical people in any walk of life. But why? I've heard you state there is no such thing as an old soul, new soul. So that just smashed my belief or thought that perhaps that that is why because there are young souls blush of shame. What are your thoughts? I know people have asked you, why is there evil? Why are these atrocities? Why do good people become afflicted with this and that? But what about what I mentioned prior? My ex is someone who is perfectly content to never move from the couch away from the TV with remote in hand and spew hate. Let the house fall down around him. Why, there are, why are there people who want to live this way? Also, and in our incarnations, I asked about coming back as animals again, or do we keep evolving forward? But I forgot to ask, can we devolve? Uh, could someone return in another life as an unsavory person or one afflicted with serious disability or illness of the person who comes to Walmart, maybe unshowered in their pajamas? Could that happen? <laughs> okay, well, all, all, uh, on a, as, an, a, as an aside from all of God's children who shop at Walmart in their pajamas, God, let's, let's, uh, let's try to be nice to everybody and, um, you know, remember that every, everyone is uh, beloved. But um, I'll try to do my best here. First of all, you know, our, our karma in the material universe is determined by our previous choices. So we are born into environments that are conducive to us continuing to live in accord with the current desires of our soul, the current likes, and desires, and aversions of our soul. You know, for some people, that means they're going to be born into modes of nature that are different from other people. You know, the Krishna outlines this in the Bhagavad Gita very clearly, where he talks about the three modes of nature. This is in the 14th chapter in particular, is a really good place to look at this if you have a copy of the Gita. And he says that, you know, um, there are three modes. There's uh, ignorance, there's passion, and there's goodness. People who are born into, um, you know, the, the one mode can change their mode. All of the modes are always mixing, and we can change our association with the modes by our free will each and every day. I could sound like I'm in the mode of goodness right now and then go and pig out on a, you know, a bowl of popcorn or something and dive right into the ignorance for a little while. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So we're always changing and it's not a fixed thing. We change our associations, we change our consciousness, we change our hearts and our association and our environments and our karma all change all the time. And yeah, you can go up or down. You can go to the highest planets where there's lots of pretty amazing, you know, high forms of pleasure and bliss. And you can go down into places that are relatively hellish. Um, but in, in bhakti, of course, none of this is the point. The point is not, do we go to a really good place by virtue of being or doing really good things? And in that place, there's no smelly Walmart shoppers or whatever, you know, or whatever your prejudice, you know, you look and you go, oh, like, I don't like that. What is that? That looks really 
uninvolved to me. I'd rather be in a place that's very blissful, like whatever our prejudices and our desires are, our fears and our attachments, our aversions, our likes and dislikes, whatever they are. The point is not to get to some place where we have the most of what we like and the least of what we dislike. The point is to love God. And when you love God, you start to see God everywhere. You see God in the person at Walmart that you find to be smelly or <laughs> that just rolled out of bed. You, you love God in the people that are very difficult to love. And maybe as time goes on, that means you make different choices too. You, you, maybe you, in the next time around, you, you know, like in life, we may not marry the same person again because we learn a lesson about the kind of consciousness we need to be around or something like that. Uh, but the point is that um, the goal is is about an, an an ever unfolding intimate personal relationship with God, and that relationship helps us to see God in all things. In which case, we start to lose. We help people bring out the best in what's there, what's in them, and uh, we tend not to make such distinctions between high and low, good and bad, ugly and beautiful. We only see God because we're just totally in love with God, and so we see God everywhere. So that's the goal. It's not like get me to the, you know, get me to J. Crew and get me out of the Walmart of the universe or something, or something like that, you know, or get me to whatever your idea of luxury and beauty and bliss is and get me away from whatever smells bad. But at the same time, there is a reality as long as we're here in the material world and we're not thinking about God, we're not learning to see God in all things, then we tend to cycle through the competing modes of material nature and ignorance. Ignorance is one that is content to be deeply asleep in the illusion of being separate and in the illusion that only by gratifying our senses and our most base desires and instincts can we be happy. And so that's darkness, that's tamas, that's ignorance. Rajas, passion, is let me work and do things and do activities in order to get a good result that's enjoyable, but I, have to, I know I'm going to have to work and sacrifice for it. Work hard, get money, get a nice car work hard, get a nice wardrobe, look really refined, work hard, get a degree, have people think of you as quite sophisticated. But it usually involves having to work and kind of bust your butt and then you get something and then you think, well, that's really what makes me someone. That's rajas, that's passion. And underlying is usually envy and greed um, and, um, and, and selfishness, right? And then there's goodness. And goodness is the one, the platform of material nature where, you know, we are concerned with being virtuous and doing good to others, doing, being good, taking care of ourselves, taking care of our bodies, take, you know, it's a high-minded consciousness that cares about the welfare of other beings and that sees the difference between spirit and matter. Oh, the bank account's not going to make me happy. The degree won't necessarily make me happy. I'm not going to just sit on my couch and eat potato chips or roll out of my bed and, uh, you know, go shopping for a semi-automatic at, <laughs> at Walmart or whatever the case might be I'm playing. But, you know, so goodness may help us to develop more highly refined sense of, of goodness and truth in the world. But even that is not the same as being constantly devoted in, in, in remembrance of God. Uh, when we think about God, all the time. Um, it changes our hearts and it, it changes us to the extent that, you know, we we're not even impressed with being good. Usually even on a subtle level, people who, from the standpoint of the bhakti scriptures, people who on a subtle level are desiring to be good, it's because they don't want to be seen as bad, understandably. They want to receive maybe some accolade for being good. Or they want to see the world become a better place, but they're forgetting that the world will eventually become a bad place because we cycle through ages of light and dark. That whatever gain you have societally is not going to be without lots of problems. So even the mode of goodness, the desire to be good and do good, is a hollow end that will eventually be dominated by either rajas or tamas, again, passion or ignorance. Because nothing in this world is permanent, nothing, it's some river that's constantly moving and these three modes are always trying to dominate one another. Just try to see because you work out and you think, ah, oh, now I'm good and I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat that, that uh, panini, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just keep the panini away from me. I'm in goodness, you know, 
And then suddenly after a little while of feeling really light and very discerning and your, your body's a sparkling temple. Um, but if you're not living in devotional remembrance of God, pretty soon you're going to be like, mm, you know, I feel so good. I'm going to start a wellness business. You know, <laughs> that's the beginning of the end. And then before you know it, you're on the couch in a dark stormy night you know, shoveling down a pint of ice cream, being like, oh my God, I hate owning a business or, you know, and this is life. Like we all deal with this stuff. So I'm not above it at all. This is like, you know, someone who tried to own a yoga studio for 10 years and all that stuff that I, you know, mortgage and blah, blah, blah. So yeah. Um, so at any rate, the point is that, um, you know, yeah, the modes of material nature are mixed and we get the results based on our choices. Just imagine that you've always been making choices. You've never not been making choices and you never will be without making choices. As you make choices, as we all know, our environments and the world around us changes to, to match and reflect the choices we're making. So you can go up or down or all around. You can go all over the, all over, in, you know, the, the innumerable universes by virtue of what you, what you associate with, what you want and don't want, etc. And the idea is that in this world, the modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance, that they just keep alternating with one another in um, relatively predictable ways, which is what makes astrology so accurate, because it's all part of the laws of nature that we can predict the, the movements of karma when we're attached to karma in these modes like this. But once we start giving our lives and our hearts to God, then we start coming off from the, uh, you know, the kind of um, the merry-go-round. And then um, at that point, though, the unique feature is that a symptom of such a person that's starting to love God and is that they see God in all things and they, they, they stop making judgments about who's high or who's low, or, and then they tend to bring out the best in people. Um, rather than seeing someone as uh, smelly and ugly and whatever, you know. So uh, not that I'm there. I get really annoyed with the uh, the smelly people too, including myself. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I get pretty smelly. So anyway, um, thank you guys for listening. I hope that this was helpful. Great questions. And I hope I did an okay job of uh, answering. If you have any more at any point in time about bhakti yoga, feel free to email me info at nightlightastrology.com. All right, Krishna, everyone.